Welcome to episode 40 of the Cashflow Connections podcast. The topic for today is real estate negotiation strategies from a former FBI hostage negotiator. I think it would be more than a mild understatement to say that our guest today is a really unique individual. In fact, he's probably been in more insane experiences than all of my previous guests combined. However, rather than go into the many details of his previous employment, today we're going to discuss how he has transitioned his skills as an FBI hostage negotiator into a negotiation consulting business which has a special curriculum for real estate professionals. So in this conversation, we're going to discuss how to use strategies to put your counterpart at ease rather than using high pressure strategies. Also, if and how negotiation strategies should be modified if you're negotiating with someone who you want to maintain a long-term relationship with. We're also going to discuss labeling and mirroring, which are great strategies not only in professional negotiations, but also in personal relationships. We're also going to discuss how to ask open-ended questions, which significantly increase the likelihood that you will identify a potential black swan rather than investing in it and then figuring out afterwards. This is something that's really useful for interviewing tenants or interviewing property managers or even sponsors. And we're also going to get into why our guest prefers getting your counterpart to actually say no before really getting into the media negotiation rather than getting him to say yes over and over again and then kind of easing them into a close, which is a strategy that was really, really popular for the last several decades. So again, this is going to be a really interesting conversation, something we haven't discussed on the program before. I really enjoyed, you know, having these interesting conversations with unique individuals with a variety of different backgrounds. So I'm I'm really looking forward to this one as well. Now, as I mentioned before, this podcast is growing every day. When it comes to real estate syndications in particular, it's quickly become one of the leading sources of information in the podcast sector. And of course, I thank you all very much for doing that. I know that you sharing these episodes that you really like with your friends and family is really beneficial, and that's really how it's been able to grow into what it is today. However, the space itself isn't very large. So although people are getting more interested in real estate and crowdfunding and and all of that, which things that we love so much, the sheer volume of listeners just isn't that big because we focus on such a unique and currently untapped niche. The reason I say this is that in order to balance that out, it's really important that the show have a significant number of reviews. So if you've listened to two or three episodes and haven't left a review yet, make sure to do so. It would be greatly appreciated. I obviously love doing this program. I love being able to provide this content for free. So all I ask in return is just a short two or three sentence review. Go to the podcast app, search for Cashflow Connections Real Estate Podcast, leave a short and honest review, and it would be greatly appreciated. All right, hope you enjoy the episode. How's it going, everyone? Our guest for today is Chris Voss, who is the author and national bestseller of Never Split the Difference. He is also an international keynote speaker, negotiation consultant, and award-winning business school professor. After 24 years as a lead FBI hostage negotiator, Chris founded the Black Swan Group, which is a firm that solves business communication problems with hostage negotiating strategies. Well, Chris, we have had about 40 guests on this program. We have interviewed some really influential people in the real estate sector, but we've actually never discussed negotiating before. And we we certainly have never had a guest quite like you. So thanks again for coming on the program. I really appreciate it. Well, I'm happy. Uh, I'm happy to be on with you, Hunter. Thank you very much. And uh, it's about time, huh? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I I obviously want to talk negotiating. I want to talk never split the difference as well. Before we really get into those details, let's talk about your background. How did you get interested in this sector in, in the first place? Uh, the hostage negotiation sector, there's a lot of sectors we're in here, right? Which, which one are you talking about? Yeah. So I guess, you know, I guess the real question I'm really interested in is, did you find out that you were really born with those type of strategies? Was this something that you had, you know, growing up as a kid that, you know, kind of pushed you in the line of being involved in the FBI and being specifically involved in hostage negotiating? Or was this something that you kind of found yourself in, you know, randomly almost? Now, I think what I was born with is what everybody's born with is emotional intelligence. Uh, you know, we, we're all born with it to some degree. Now, whether or not it gets developed is a second question. Now, I, I, I found this, you know, by following, you know, one um, tangent after another. Uh, I, I have looked back over my early years a lot and to see if I was, if I could look back and think that I was always a negotiator. like. Um, uh, a friend of mine here in L.A. is an extraordinary woman named Cindy Mori. She's uh, been Oprah's talent booker for 17 years. 
like Cindy can tell you stories about when she was nine years old at a cafeteria, if one of her friends had a, you know, a bad ice cream sandwich, they'd hand it to her and she'd take it back and fix that problem. <laughs> she did that at nine. I can't point to any stories like that. Um, I just, I found my way into law enforcement. I got interested in my mid teens because I was blown away at the possibility of how creative it could be to, to do something really good, uh, uh, but be very creative at the same time. I saw a movie about two police officers in New York City who were wildly creative, and it just inspired me. I thought I was going to be a cop, ended up um, following one tangent after another with the FBI. And then the FBI sent me to New York City, which I didn't want to go to New York because it was so expensive, and I was an Iowa boy, mid Midwestern guy. And New York ended up being cool. I love New York. I mean, I spent 14 years there. I spent more than double the amount of time that most agents spent there. I loved it. And then I got involved. Uh, I was in SWAT originally. I, you know, I, um, but I like, I like crisis response. I like figuring things out. I like decision making. I like getting stuff done. I grew up from a, a, a figure it out environment. Like um, my son and I joked the DeVos family motto is how hard could it be? Which is kind of like, you know, figure it out, get, get the job done. And sure. so I went from, and hostage negotiators, you know, in the midst of a crisis, they're the people that have to show up and get it done, solve it uh, and get it done. You, you can't dither with, uh, oh my God, what if something goes wrong? The urgency of the situation requires movement. And then I got into hostage negotiation. I found it was cooler and more satisfying and more rewarding and more in-depth than SWAT ever was. And, and, you know, then one thing led to another and I'm talking to you from Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so let's let's talk briefly about the Black Swan Group. How did you kind of transition those skills you learned in your 24 years at the FBI and then into kind of the business consulting, business negotiating? Or what, what service did you really set out to provide when it came to the Black Swan Group as a whole? Well, mo most uh, – how to use the intent – these intensely applicable and crazy effective – skills in business and personal life. Now, this all started, you know, uh, when I got on the, I had a volunteer in a suicide hotline because I was eminently unqualified to be a hostage negotiator. And the only way that I could get qualified was to volunteer on a hotline. And the hotline ended up being this intense laboratory of emotional intelligence. How do you learn emotional intelligence to get people in their most intense moments or one way or another, the most difficult moments to move their life forward? And then the crazy thing about that on the hotline, which blew me away, you were limited to 20 minutes. Like when I first got there, I imagined, you know, you get somebody suicidal or somebody with real problems on the line, you might be on, on the phone with them for hours, which in our personal life, when people have problems, it seems like we talk to them forever and nothing ever happens. And I thought, right, so the hotline call's got to be that long. And they said, no, if you do this right, you'll be done in 20 minutes or less. And if, you get, if, you, if it takes you longer than 20 minutes, you're screwing it up. And I thought, that, you know, this stuff is so crazy. I, one of my favorite calls was I, I turned a guy around one night in probably about six minutes. And I only said three things to him in the interaction. And this was just too powerful uh, to not be used in real life. So I started applying it to my real life. I started uh, working it into my professional interactions. Then when I finally got trade on as a hostage negotiator, I said to myself, you know, I've been doing this on the hotline for the last year. I just didn't have a SWAT team outside. Hmm. But for me, the issue was always, you know, what's the issue? The issue was always, why can't you apply this to personal life? Why should only terrorists or suicidal be the beneficiaries of the, you know, these powerful emotional intelligence skills. So I've been applying it and learning how to apply it one way or another. And then a real tipping point uh, to take it into the business world probably came when I went through a, a Harvard Law School's negotiation course. I, you know, I, I negotiated my way in there because I wasn't a student. I was still an on-duty FBI agent. And that's never been done before. Uh, and th while I was there, I used my hostage negotiation skills on a law school students. These people with these giant brains. I mean, their intellects probably couldn't be, couldn't be bigger. There's, there's uh, if you if you're in Harvard Law School, if you even get in, you've got a monstrous sized intellect. And I was rolling over them with my simple blue collar hostage negotiation skills. And that was when I knew that, that it applied to business and personal life. 
Interesting. So I think this is, I'm sure this is a question you get frequently. Um, the way that my personal business is set up and probably a lot of the listeners, I have identified eight, 10, maybe 12 individuals, companies that I want to work with, you know, for the rest of my life. And Good I, the, I, there's probably, yeah, I appreciate that. And I can imagine, obviously the suicide component is, is interesting um, as opposed to some of the components that may be associated with a, a hostage negotiation. So I guess my question is, how do you cater these strategies or do you cater these strategies to the fact that not only do you want both sides to feel like they've come away with a good deal, you also want to preserve the relationship into the future as opposed to something like hostage negotiating. Do you have any thoughts well, on that? Yeah, interesting. It, but, uh, the overriding feeling is not that both sides want to come away with a good deal because that's incredibly sub uh, subjective. What they want to feel like is they get treated fairly. And I mean, that's it more than anything else. Like, uh, you know, you want to feel like you did as good as you could have. But good is such a relative term that it's more that if people feel like they were treated fairly, that they were hurt out, that they weren't uh, rolled over. I mean, it, that's why one of the reasons in all interactions, I mean, what's the F word? The F word is fair. And it's rare that you're going to find a business deal that the F-bomb is not dropped somewhere along the line. <laughs> and the, the word fair is so intense, it creates such an intense reaction that uh, a lot of times people say, I, I just want what's fair. Um, and that seems, that, that's, a, that's actually a, 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 a stealth accusation because if, if i say look i just want what's fair i've just accused you of being unfair which is going to hit you in your core in a way that you don't even realize and it's it's probably it's probably going to knock you off your game um some people use it badly on a regular on a regular basis because they say look i've given you a fair offer and that that's a, a manipulative way to try to uh move your offer forward now, that always results in tremendous discomfort and subtle anger from the other side uh, because that's an accusation that you're not being fair and accepting it. And, a, and a, lot of, a lot of cutthroat negotiators love to say, look, we're giving you a fair offer. Right. As if somehow you are at fault for not taking it. Um, so uh, why am I talking about this? Again, people... The desire to be treated fairly is actually more important than whether or not somebody got a good deal. And they can live with walking away from a deal if they got treated fairly. Or they'll take a worse deal if they feel they got treated fairly. It's crazy. There's this, it's, you know, my son is my director of operations, uh, Brandon Voss, and he wrote a, a piece for a blog called the, the Four Most Emotional Words in Any Negotiations. And one of them is the word fair. And it, it's, an, I, I've yet to see a negotiation that the F, the F word, the word fair didn't come up in some form. That makes sense. Um, I guess, you know, that, that, it's interesting that you actually started with that word because that is kind of the whole driving goal, but also just an incredibly common term that's used. Uh, before we even get into, you know, that stage, what are some of the upfront framing strategies or strategies you can use generally that will start the conversation off on the right foot? Well, you know, uh, to be disarming, first of all, is, is really important. And, um, and what that boils down to is like, if you know the other side is harboring, ne harboring negativity about you, the two millimeter shift, because we all say, look, I don't want you to think this. I don't want you to think that, you know, if your emotional intelligence is, and everybody's got it, is driving you to say, I don't want you to think, do, or feel this. All right, so your emotional intelligence is picking up really good. But anybody that's tried that tactic has had it backfire enough on them that they typically don't say it. So the two millimeter shift is to, to just call it out straight without denying it and say, you know, I'm sure it looks like this. I'm sure it feels like this. I'm sure it feels like, uh, I'm sure I look like a bully. I'm sure, I'm sure it feels like we're pushing you around. I'm sure it feels like we don't, we don't have uh, any regard for your position. Now that has the actual opposite effect. Um, and because in, in our, in our, in our, the imag in our imagination, in the, in the, in the simulation in our head, we imagine a person saying like, 
thanks for saying that. That's true. <laughs> and you're right. You have been doing this. And they're going to repeat it over and over and over again. In fact, what happens is the opposite. People who say, you know, I appreciate you saying that. Well, they say, no, you know, uh, that's not it. Uh, don't be so hard on yourself. Um, it has a complete opposite effect. And we've got, that, we've got neuroscience data that actually proves that that happens because uh, the emotions in the mind are governed by a system called the limbic system, which operates very much like the respiratory system, which means you only have partial control over it. And are you breathing while you're asleep? Yes. Is your emotional system operating while you're asleep? Yes. There's never a moment that, you, that your limbic system or the emotional architecture in your brain, there's never a moment in your life while you're alive that it's not working. And they've identified that and then they've run ne neuroscience uh, MR, fMRI scans to watch what happens under the circumstances that I talked about. It's called labeling and identification of emotions. And each and every time a negative emotion was identified, the brain activity that housed the negative emotion diminished. Not some of the time, every time. And it's a two millimeter shift, of, two millimeter shift in going from denial to identification. So you asked me before about opening moves. If in the midst, if you're approaching a negotiation and your, your gut instinct is telling you that there's something that you'd love to say, I don't want you to think this, <laughs> then just make the two millimeter shift and call it out in advance. Yeah, I like that uh, a lot. And actually, you mentioned a word there, labeling, which I definitely want to give you the opportunity to expand on. So let's talk briefly about labeling and why it's so important. All right. So in a hostage negotiation world, there are eight FBI negotiation skills, and we refer to it as the FBI eight. One of those is called emotion labeling, where you simply, it's self-defining, you label an emotion that you hear. Now, we've tweaked it slightly for the business world. And we just call it labeling and we label either emotions or dynamics or things that we suspect someone might hear. And we toyed with a lot of other words for this term. You know, we toyed with probe. We, we uh, toyed with um, echo, um, prompt, um, because it is a probe. Uh, it's very much like sonar. You know, you bounce a verbal ob observation off someone. And their response gives you the information, a clearer picture of what it is that you're faced with. But we just call it labeling because it's the most straightforward tool. The crazy thing about labeling is when I brought the FBI 8 into the business world, I thought it was going to be the least applicable. And we've come to find out it's the most applicable. You can almost do an entire negotiation using no other skill. And we do that all the time. Um, it is the most, it's the most effective stealth weapon that we have and it's total stealth and it's, it's the most flexible. You can use it to, to get in and change someone's perceptions, dial down their negative emotions, dial up their positive emotions, get feedback on how they see things, what their vision is of what they're seeing. And it's also the tool that you use to, to gently adjust it and, and help them see something else. So labeling is this insane skill that some of our real estate people have actually referred to as the tool that they use to unlock the floodgates of truth telling. And that was a straight, almost word for word description from one of the people we've coached in real estate. Now, when, when you say, you know, labeling, I guess, would, would an accurate description of that be, you know, putting a name to what you're hearing from them when it comes to their answers to partic particular questions? Um, how would you define labeling, I guess? Just yeah. It's, okay. it's, it's, putting in, it's putting a name on it, and then we teach calling it out in a very specific way, which is typically it sounds, it seems, it looks, it feels, you sound, you seem, you look. Now, that's actually, you can easily be um, deceived by the simplicity of that. And the simplicity of it, it's designed to actually bypass the prefrontal cortex of the brain, which is where the decision-making takes place, and trigger a thought process that engages the limbic system. Because if I say to you, well, it seems like this, your reaction is going to be like, hmm, does it seem like that? And that triggers that contemplation. Mm. And that's a very designed effect that I'm intentionally having on your brain and your thoughts. You don't even know that I'm doing that. And that's why it has to be simply done because what a lot of people from therapy, they've gotten into a bad habit of saying like, what I'm hearing is, and that's actually 
there's functional errors in that that cause the prefrontal cortex to be re-engaged and it blocks the thought process that you wanted to trigger. Got it. So basically you're you're asking you're asking a question that takes some cognitive capacity to to answer, but that cognitive capacity is not dedicated to putting up a defensive answer. It's really contemplating a question. Is that kind uh, of you picked up on a subtle point of that. It's the way to ask questions without having the other side know you're asking questions. And that's exactly the point. Got it. Very cool. And something you also talk about in the book, which I think is really effective, not only just in you know, hostage negotiation and business, but also in you know relationships, for example, uh, which is mirroring. Uh, briefly talk about what mirroring is and give us an example, I guess, of how you can use it in a situation. Yeah. And this is not the mirroring that everybody's learned about. This is not the mirroring where if they put their left hand to their chin, you put your left hand to your chin, where you're you're imitating their body language. The hostage negotiator's mirror is one of the greatest information gathering tools that we have. And it's just repeating the last one to three words of what someone has just said. Or when you get when you get good at learning how to do that, you'll pick a selected one to three words that you want the other person to elaborate on, that you want more information on. We've got one client that always uses it and all the other sides offers because how they elaborate and they'll elaborate every time how they elaborate will tell them the relative strength or weakness of the position. And he loves the mirror as one of the great diagnostic tools of the other side's positions. And uh, it triggers an automatic response. It's probably the most, like I said, information triggering skill um, while it does build the relationship and, and help reestablish trust in the interaction. It, it's not specifically designed that for that. And we find some people that mirroring is so effective and it's so invisible and the other person has a tendency to talk so much between your mirrors. I've run into people that that's all they did. <laughs> they didn't do anything else. We were at a, we were at a two week, uh, we were at a two day weekend training we were conducting once in New Hampshire. And um, uh, we ran into a gentleman that we were standing there talking with him in a group for about 20 minutes before I realized that he was doing nothing but mirroring. And it was driving his wife crazy because she was the only one that was picking up on it. And he was having the best time. He Not only did he mirror everybody, but the reason it drove her crazy because everybody came up to her and said, your husband is so interesting. We just <laughs> love talking to him. He's got to be the most charming and interesting guy here. And he'd be standing there with this big smile on his face and his wife would be glaring at him because she knew that he was doing nothing other than mirroring people. And he was the most charming man the entire weekend. <laughs> Could you give us a, a quick example, I guess, of a, a typical mirror that may take place in a business setting or otherwise? In a business setting or otherwise? <laughs> Got it. And so I would, <laughs> yeah, I did pick up. On now you stop because <laughs> you felt yourself wanting to respond, didn't you? Yes. I mean, it it, it kind of choked me up a bit, even though we're in the middle of the conversation on the topic. Uh, totally. It's, it's an open-ended question, which you would almost never not expect to hear an answer to. Right. Right. And you, you know, I mean, you felt yourself drawn into it. So if we'd have been in a conversation where you hadn't just asked me to mirror. Totally. You wouldn't have seen it. You, yeah, you'd, totally. You'd have just, and, and, and here's the other thing that I noticed. Very rarely when someone realized they've just been got, and the other side could say, gotcha, that typically infuriates people. But your reaction was not to be infuriated at that is all. That's very it, true. It no, wasn't. 100%. A, you, you knew I had just got you. And how often does the other fi side feel that they've just, the gotcha moment just happened and they're not infuriated? And, and you laughed. You, you laughed about it and said, okay, you know, that was it. That was good. You know, you, yeah, you got me. But, and, and that's one of the, the key points of these skills is, if the other side catches you, which they don't, but let's pretend they will because that's what everybody's worried about. 
we're afraid that they'll suddenly burst into flames and start screaming at us and slam their hands down on the table and storm out of the room. And they don't. Right. I mean, it certainly has to be that, you know, both labeling and mirroring, it's <laughs> you're, you're showing that you're listening to them. So how can they be mad at that? Even if you're doing some kind of negotiating strategy, the, at the end of the day, the strategy is not some high pressured sales tactic. It's, right. It's it's not creating false scarcity. It's not creating false time frames. It's it's literally just asking them for clarification. <laughs> so right. how can they be mad at that? And if yeah. anybody doesn't want you to listen, doesn't that tell you a lot about your counterpart? Yeah, that that's a good point. Um, you know, even with that in mind, are there any mistakes, or I guess you need to be careful of when kind of pursuing those two strategies? You know. Um, we get some people that want to want to use seven, eight, nine skills all in a row because they're in a hurry. And they'll do that in a, in a conversation or even worse, they'll do it in an email. They just destroy every skill. Mm. The big problem is getting comfortable with the effective pause. And if you got a good mirror, shut up. Uh, you got a good label, shut up. Um, don't get carried away. Let, let each skill sink in and do its job without staffing on the previous skill. And we see that a lot. We were doing a coaching session earlier today, and um, I was blown away at how much people had learned from us and were using the skills. But then they were, you know, they're putting four things in an email when they should have put in two. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, you, you know, you got to slow down just a little bit. It's, it's a delay to save time. It's, if you if you speed up too much in your interactions, it's spinning your wheels. It, it would be like if your if your car is stuck in the snow or the mud or some place where you got no traction, you got your foot on the gas and the speedometer says you're going seventy miles an hour because the wheels are going fast, but you're not actually moving because you got no traction. So you got to you got to let your skills sink in and get you the traction so you can start moving again. A lot of your book focuses on finding out what your counterparts driving factor is. Essentially, yeah. this is like what's motivating them to negotiate in the first place. What would you see the major and, and most common driving factor is when it comes to negotiating, particularly as it pertains to business? Well, um, you know, sort of uh, generically, which is going to sound really vague, but there is no more drive, no more dominating factor than fear of loss. And figuring out what someone's fear of loss is, what they're afraid of losing, is one of the reasons why you got to get into these skills. Because typically, what they fear losing is not going to be what you'd uh, what you'd expect. And it takes a little bit of practice to begin to uncover it. Um, so, uh, you know, you, 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 what's their vision of the future? What losses? People are more likely to take a risk to avoid a loss than they are to accomplish a gain, which is why. You know, most sales is backwards, you know, because most sales is your value proposition, your pitch and gain. Well, whoever you're faced with is a lot more worried about what they're going to lose. So, you know, the, the old question, what is it that keeps you up at night? What keeps people up at night is loss. But people are so sick of answering that question. They don't, it used to be a good question. They don't answer it anymore. <laughs> so if we, if we bother asking an open-ended question, Ours is typically like, what's going to happen if you, if you do nothing? Mm. I mean, best case scenario, if you do nothing, what happens? You know, worst case scenario, if you do nothing, what happens? Best case scenario, if you take action, what happens? Now your delta is, your difference is, what's the difference in gain and loss? You know, the gain of a positive action versus the loss of doing nothing. And as soon as you get people, as soon as you understand what their vision of that is, now you can negotiate, but you have to, you have to know what losses they're seeing in their head because it's going to be the dominating overriding influence on their decision-making. Now there are people out there that say, well, I make deals all the time, pitch and game. Yeah. Yeah. You're making 10% of the deals you could be making with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, certainly. And I mean, it's kind of a, a scale, right? And certain, certain people are more motivated by the allure of gains and certain people are more motivated by the fear of missing out. But then sometimes there's this weird inversion that takes place where if you miss out on a gain, there's a lot of people that view that as a actual loss 
and they will forever live their life as if they've lost that money by not taking action because of the perceived gain that they could have incurred. So, I mean, that's something that I've experienced personally. You know, I missed an opportunity yeah. to invest in a very lucrative investment a few years ago. And at the time, I spent a couple of months where I felt like I had lost that money. Not really, yeah. I just stayed the same. <laughs> it's crazy, so, right? And, and, yeah. and that's an indicator of what we do to ourselves. And then consequently, if you got skills that can get in there and navigate that with someone, think of the power you unleash and your ability to influence people. What do you think is the most underutilized strategy during negotiations? You know, by and large, it's here in the other side out. Um, because most people see negotiation as a battle of arguments. You got to make your case. I got to, I got to come up with my value proposition. I got to tell you why my value proposition is, is important. So you're starting down really the wrong track. You're wasting a tremendous amount of time because you haven't taken the time to hear the other side out as to what's actually important to them. You know, they, they might have a better deal for you if you just shut up. Now, let's say that they're going to have a better deal for you only 10% of the time. Well, then that means that you can focus your efforts on the other 90% when you don't have to shut up. You know, if 10% of your deals, 10% of your great deals could be made by you just shutting up, doesn't that save you a lot of effort? Uh, but the, the people's willingness to shut up in negotiations and hear the other side out is maybe the the single biggest mistake I see on a regular basis. Certainly. I mean, that goes back to your, your question about mirroring. You know, silence after that statement is really what you're going to get so much more information out. Even if the person sounds like they're finished, you just wait just a little bit longer. It's uncomfortable for both of you. Um, actually, just, just talk briefly about science itself. I know this is a unique tool, but um, and you kind of touched on it just by saying shut up, but I'm sure you've seen just people completely unload, uh, particularly as it relates to the name of your company, um, a variety of different stuff. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, silence is really hard for two out of three of us. Um, uh, we believe that the world breaks up evenly into three types, fight, flight, and make friends. And it's from our caveman days, and those are the three types that survive. You know, uh, the, the, the caveman that said, let me stand around here for a little while and see what happens. He got eaten by the saber-toothed tiger. So, but uh, the, the caveman that, that tried to fight off the tiger, the caveman that run from it, or the caveman who understood how to make friends with perceived that threats, they're the ones that survived. So of those three types, only one of them is really comfortable with silence. You know, the flight guy, the, the very analytical guy, that analytical guy, gal, they like silence because it gives them a chance to think. Now the, the, now, the fight type guy, he likes control. He wants to move things forward. Time is money, he or she. So silence is an opportunity to talk. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, and if you're, if you're dealing with an analyst, the analyst is just saying, like, I wish you'd shut up long enough for me to think. And the analyst is not talking, but the assertive guy is going like, ah, oh, well, the other guy's silent. That means he wants to hear more from me. Now, the third type who's scared of silence, the uh, make friends, the relationship-oriented person. Now, what scares them about silence is since they're so relationship-focused and they like to soothe with words, that when they go silent, that's how they signal fury. When that, you know, give someone the silent treatment, that's a worse thing to, to withdraw from the relationship. And so that's the harshest thing they could think of to do to somebody. So again, they're dealing with the analyst. The analyst is shut up because shut up because the analyst wants to think. Well, the, you know, the relationship oriented person is going like, oh my God, oh my God, they're so angry. They're giving me the silent treatment. I got to talk. I got to talk. And the analyst again is thinking like, would you please just shut up? I want to think. So silence can be a very difficult thing for two out of three of us. But in reality, like anything else, you use silence as a diagnostic to find out what's going on. You know, maybe the other side wants to think some more. Shut up. You're going to get a reaction. Maybe the other side has more to tell you. Shut up. They're going to give you more information. Mm -hmm. Maybe the other side feels that there's a problem in, your, in, in how you're interacting in a relationship. Shut up. They're going to give you that information when you give them the chance. So, you know, the effective pause is, is named effective for a reason. It's highly effective. <laughs> and getting comfortable with using it is, is the challenge for some of us. Certainly. 
So I know that there's there's obviously been so many books on this topic, but the vast majority of them have been focused on getting to yes, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the key there where you hear people say, ask them seven simple questions, all of which are, you know, is now still a good time? Uh, you know, are you, you know, can we have the call now? Those type of questions, you know, great day, isn't it? Type of questions where if you, the more you get them to agree with you, the more likely you are to kind of ease them into a close. And then, you know, whether or not they enjoy the product or not is, is kind of subsequent to that. Um, <laughs> I know that you have a different strategy. So let's discuss, you know, how yours is different and, and why you prefer your strategy. Yeah, that yes thing has been so overdone that every person, you know, maybe there was a time in, in, in place when the yes momentum or the yesable agreement or there's even an academic term for it. It's called mere agreement. Uh, and, I, and I've looked at the study and I think there's huge problems with the study. But maybe, let, all right, so let, I'll pretend I'm willing to go along that there was a time in mankind's history when that yes thing worked. The problem is every hustler out there has used it on us. Nice. Every, every wolf, every con man, every wolf of Wall Street wants to get you saying yes. They want you to get you on this yes momentum. These used car salesmen, these, you know, these people that are sharing, selling timeshares and swamp land and buildings that haven't even been built yet. <laughs> you know, every con man out there is trying that. Now, the problem with that is, let's say you're a legitimate business person and you're just trying to be respectful. You're simply aiming for confirmation yes, not trap yes. Well, what happens if you try to give a battered child a hug? Because we've all been battered with this yes nonsense. If you're a good person, if you're a good, genuine, caring person, and you see a battered child who's been beaten, and all you want to do is give them a warm hug of affection, what happens? Does it matter that your your uh, your uh, embrace of integrity uh, is meant to be supportive and nurturing? No, they flinch anyway. They duck. They run. They run away from you because they've been so battered by being beaten and and. Business people worldwide have been battered with this yes crap, and there isn't anybody out there that you start this on that doesn't immediately become defensive. Um, I, you know, we, we got a training module we're building with a company called Lightspeed, and they're, they're brilliant. They, we, you know, they're, they're, their technology for delivering training is wonderful. And I'm talking to these guys through this the other day, and a guy says, yeah, I got an approach um, on the street the other day with a guy with a position and he looked at me and he said, do you like to breathe clean air? <laughs> and I felt in the moment as if I was being had. And the minute I said yes to him, I couldn't get away from him fast enough. Sure. I just felt completely had in that moment. Now, there's two things here. Some people out there would say like, well, yeah, he still got a yes. Well, of course he did. And what's the follow-on response? I couldn't get away from the guy quick enough. You do not want to leave people with that kind of a residue. And another salesman said, yeah, man, we call those clawbacks. Like, I'll get a yes on a deal, and we'll get a signature. And the next thing I know, I got people that are clawing to get their money back. I can't get my commission. So my, my clawbacks are killing me. And what would, what would happen to your business if you just eliminated the clawbacks? And it's, it's also so bad that I had a wealth management person that was in, my, in our class at USC in the, in, the, in the business school in the MBA program. And he said, I had a client stop talking to me entirely. And then her, she was so leery of talking to me that she had her secretary call my secretary to move her accounts, which were substantial. And I got her on the phone and she said, I just didn't want you to talk me into something again. <laughs> now, this is this yes nonsense. And it's, it's probably the worst corrosion in, in, in business. And I don't know anybody out there who doesn't have people who aren't getting back to them. We refer to them as non-responders. Someone who hasn't spoken to you anywhere from two days to two months to two weeks. And they will not return your phone calls or your emails. I guarantee you this is this yes nonsense where you eventually it corrodes a relationship and a trust in a relationship so much it won't even talk to you. Certainly. 
I, I want I want you to give the opportunity to kind of briefly, you know, discuss your strategy. If yes is and the repetitive yes is something that you don't find to be effective and has led to some really uncomfortable business situations and a lot of people doing clawbacks, like you say, uh, what would be kind of your your counter example to that or your counter strategy to that? Well, there's really there's really two parts to it, and and you have to have you have to have both parts. Now, the first part is so insanely stupid that until people use it, they just don't believe it's true. And it's flip your yes questions to no. And it's something like, would you agree with this? To do you disagree? Would, uh, or from, is, does this look like something that it would work for you? To, is it ridiculous to think that this would work for you? Mm. I mean, it's just changing your closed-ended word that you're driving for instead of driving for no trigger, yes. I mean, the, the emotional reaction is insane. It's, uh, you know, and it's why these days we call this a calibrated no. And uh, a calibrated no is worth no less than five yeses. Mm. Because what people do when they say no, they go, no. And as a matter of fact, we need to do this, 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 and this. <laughs> right. Well, that's your next five yeses, which you didn't even have to ask for. And they feel in control. And they called all the shots and they give you all the implementation because yes is nothing without how anyway. You got to have how. And when you come up with a calibrated no, you get the rest of the how. You, you get them laying it all out. These, these are the next steps we got to take. Instead of saying, what are the next steps? They'll, they feel so protected and so organized when they say no, they'll let the next ones out. Now, I said this was a two-part strategy and that, that's the first part. Second part, which is critical because – your calibrated no might not be enough. And in the event it's no, what you, what you have to realize is that you weren't listening before and you weren't summarizing their perspective before. You weren't doing this Stephen Covey advice of seek first to understand and be understood. Covey told us that was important, but he didn't tell us how to do it. So how you do it is now you begin to summarize their perspective and the very next thing after you've gotten a no, if your deal isn't there, you have to get them to say that's right. Not you're right, but you got to get them to say that's right. And that is, that is the next biggest possible breakthrough that you, you could get. And we have had more people trigger the entire agreement by getting the other side to say that's right. And right after they said that's right, they gave our client everything they wanted. Mm. And this gets back to this, I felt I was treated fairly. Mm -hmm. It's really the entire system coming into play. Yeah, exactly. When somebody says that's right, they feel they were treated fairly. They treated, feel, feel they were hurt out. And they feel connected to you. And they don't know they feel connected to you. They just feel great. Um, our co-author, Tal Raz, has deemed it the subtle epiphany. And in the epiphany moment is when you take action in a positive way. And that's, that's why the second part of that advice is critical because prior to them going silent, what's happened is you haven't got a single that's right out of them. You probably got some your rights and your rights is what we say to people to ask them to politely shut up and go away. Mm -hmm. Love it. That's really interesting. And that's definitely how you kind of end the conversation with them feeling like they had a good deal. But not only that, they feel like they've been heard. They feel like they've been listened to. They've been treated with respect. And now they're ready to close because you've reached a mutual agreement because of the fact that you've treated them with respect. It makes total sense. Yeah. Um, and then you know, after that, after that process takes place, obviously, you know, referrals are a huge part of any business, particularly in the investment space for a variety of reasons. Do you have any strategies specifically related to that sector of you know, typical negotiations and then the actual closings of the opportunities? Yeah, I think the biggest place where people are killing themselves on referrals is not understanding where the important communication is, or in particular, where the important positive communication is. Like people are typically positive up front and then mediocre at the end at best. And actually, it needs to be the opposite. Your, your, your most critical moment in any, any interaction is the last impression. The last impression is the lasting impression. And there's Gallup data out there that backs that up. The Gallup poll, you know, they're the organization that have been polling people for questions and information since the dawn of time almost. I mean, I can't remember a moment where Gallup poll wasn't out there. 
What does that mean? What that means is Gallup is sitting on a mountain of human behavior information. And I'm at a Gallup seminar probably back in 2009, and they say people don't remember things the way they happen. They remember the most intense moment and how it ends. Mm. Now, the important part about that is what's not there. What's not there is there's no mention whatsoever of how it began. So you can get away with a mediocre first impression if you get a great last impression. Most people focus so much on a first impression, they pay no attention to the last impression because they thought it was going to carry them all the way through. Well, if your last impression is mediocre, the last impression is a lasting impression. You go around leaving a mediocre impression on people because it wipes out all previous memories. And I think that's the biggest issue for referrals across the planet, let alone in real estate, because people will claim that they're going to give you a referral, but they don't because you left a mediocre impression. Yeah. So uh, we have covered, you know, basically everything from A to Z, and I, I really appreciate going through that. And you know, I want to be respectful of your time, but I cannot help but ask, you know, to if if you'd be able to share with us a story of a su successful negotiation, whether FBI or otherwise, uh, just whatever, whatever you would prefer. Um, I think the listeners would really enjoy it given that's really outside of their area of interest and expertise. Yeah, I'd be happy to. And, and I hope we're going to give a, ch a chance to tell people about the real estate course that my company has. Oh yeah, absolutely. If you want to do that now, I'd be happy to do them. We'll also, um, you know, do it at the end and include it in the show notes page as well. All right, yeah, on, on our website, website uh, blackswanltd.com, we've got a real estate negotiation course that we've come up with specifically for people in a real estate environment. We're really happy with it. Um, you know, people are hostage in real estate deals. You know, they've got anxieties about their fears, their hopes and fears for the future and their memories of the past. And as it turns out, that's exactly the profile of a kidnapped victim's family. And we created a tremendous amount of strategies for dealing with people effectively when they have these kinds of feelings on the line. A lot of it is counterintuitive stuff, like focusing on the last impression. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, another one is one of the worst things you could say to someone is, How are you? when you know they're bad. And if they're in the midst of a real estate deal and they're stressed, they ain't good because they don't know when it's going to close, when it's going to be over. Are you going to clear escrow? Is this deal going to go through? Is, is a buyer, the seller going to go away for some stupid reason over inspections? There's so much anxiety built in that, you know, the, uh, there's an opposite approach. How are you is a, is a very well-intentioned thing to say. I don't fault the intent behind it. There's a far more effective way to navigate with people emotionally in these high pressure situations. And we help people eliminate, eliminate those problems, which then, of course, also helps to contribute to their increasing their referral rate and staying in business. Very cool. And I will definitely get that link from you and, and keep that in the show notes page. So if the listeners are interested, both those things, referrals and leaving a, a lasting positive you know, impression is just critical. So, you know, I definitely think those listeners should check that out. Um, so I appreciate you sharing that. And yeah, like I mentioned, whatever story you think is appropriate, um, obviously want to hear it and give you the opportunity to do so. Well, you know, um, w one of our tactics is, is the, uh, and I apologize for the, for the street noise. Yeah, I don't know how much of you are picking up. It's okay. I can hear you know, one of the tactics. <laughs> uh, one of the tactics we're in love with is what we refer to as the accusations audit, which is calling out the negatives in advance. And uh, in the company, I got two brilliant coaches. Uh, Brandon Voss is coaching, and, and another guy, uh, Derek Gaunt, is coaching. Der Derek had a, had a deal recently where um, it was a settlement with an insurance company, and it was the statute of limitations was getting ready to run out, and, and the family had just drugged their feet for two years. He gets a call from the daughter of a guy who was injured, and she's saying, like, I, I need help with this settle with the insurance company. Now, a year and a half ago, they offered us $10,000. Number one, I want $25,000. But my mom never responded. And I've now found out that we got two weeks to cut the deal. Not only do we have two weeks, but this is December. He gets a call from this woman in December. 
and their time frame runs out on December 26th. When was the last time you tried to get an insurance company to do anything in December, let alone anybody? And he sat down and he said, let's do the accusations order. Oh, by the way, she'd taken her case to three separate attorneys, including based on her description, one of whom was an ambulance chaser. And every attorney turned her down flat. They said, if you'd have come to us two years ago, we could have made this deal for you. But with two weeks to go, you're screwed. You're not going to get anything. She, she, she gets our guy, Derek, on the phone. And Derek says, let's make out a list of all the negative things the person at the insurance company is going to think when you call them. And they came up with a list of 17 things. And she said, now, now do I have to actually say this on the phone? He said, yeah, you do. You're going to call them on the phone. You're going to lay out each and every one of these things. <laughs> boom, boom. We're late. We're lazy. We're greedy. We drug our feet. We're inattentive. We don't care. All the things that might go through somebody's head on the other side. They got $25,000 from the real estate or from the, uh, from the insurance company. Just by really identifying those negatives up front, addressing them in a way that's, that's appropriate, but also makes them understand their position. Right. 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 When you find somebody on the other side, their reasons for not helping you are far more compelling for the reasons they are, would help you. The reasons they wouldn't help you are the accusations they're going to have in their head that are unfair, unrealistic, un inappropriate, all the stuff that you want to deny. Call it all out and reset the game in the moment. Put that person in a position where there, there is no, they will be no more likely, it maximizes the likelihood that they will do whatever they can for you. And then find out what they can do instead of trying to bully them into it. And the, re the results, results we get on a regular basis are, are, are pretty astounding. Love it. All right, Chris. Well, again, I really enjoyed the conversation and I love the book. Uh, for the listeners, uh, Never Split the Difference, fantastic book, extremely educational, extremely entertaining. Um, Chris, you want to tell the listeners also how they can find more about your firm and, and how they can potentially find out about these courses that you were mentioning earlier? Yeah, go to the, go to the website, blackswanltd.com. There's a link there to our, our, our complimentary newsletter that comes out once a week. People love the newsletter. It's short, sweet articles uh, that are easy to digest. They come out once a week. The most recent one uh, that we put out is how to negotiate when you have no leverage. That's got a huge amount of, amount of views. People love that one. Um, but at the website, you can find a real estate negotiation course. We've got a number of other products that are free. Like I said, the, the newsletter, The Edge, is free. It's a good price. <laughs> totally. And it also, we got training announcements um, through, through the newsletter, so you can keep up. We're, you know, we're going to do a training session in New York May 18th, and we're probably going to be in Dallas in September. And we're going to give training at both those locations that we're not given anywhere else. So uh, we got a lot of stuff on our website, blackswanltd.com. It it's a gold mine, and a lot of the gold is free. <laughs> all right chris well thanks again listeners thanks for checking it out have a good one hunter thank you very much a pleasure to be on your show all right listeners thanks for checking out the episode as always the contact information for our guest will be available in the show notes page which is hosted on soundcloud itunes and stitcher don't forget if you want access to some of the free goodies that i'm talking about at the beginning of these episodes like free ebooks weekly investor emails, and articles about some of the most important investment-related topics, make sure that you have created an account with CFC because this stuff is automatically available. You can do this by going to cashflowconnections.com and signing up as an accredited investor. Of course, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hunterthompson at cashflowconnections.com. Thanks again. <laughs>